It's sad to say that not all cars sell. Some are just dead and lying cold in the inventories of dealerships. It sucks, but probably there are grounded reasons why such is the case. Hello everyone, this is Ted from Carland TV. It's time to get in the front seat, as today I will be updating you again about the slowest selling cars here in the U.S. as of November 2024, based on the market day supply data published by CarEdge. Before I start, I would really appreciate it if you would push those buttons below, the subscribe button, the notification bell, all of them. This is not necessary, but those little clicks help a brother out. Plus, it pushes me to give you more valuable car-related content on your screen. Now buckle up and let's get back to the video. Audi Q8 The list starts with the Audi Q8. CarEdge said that this particular car has a market day supply of 270. It's high, but that means that the Q8 still has a massive inventory that needs to be emptied. It's too bad that Audi is struggling to do just that. Things like stiff competition and changing consumer priorities within the luxury SUV market have ruined things for the Q8. After all, the Q8 has been positioned by Audi as its premium coupe-style SUV. This SUV, by all means, is no cheap purchase. And of course, that's one reason why even luxury lovers aren't too itchy in bringing it home. Its sticker price starts around $72,000 or so. While it's true that there's nothing wrong here on the surface, it's very well established that the Q8 is competing against more popular rivals, such as the BMW X6, Mercedes-Benz GLE Coupe, and Porsche Cayenne. These models often attract more attention, especially when we talk about Porsche and BMW, since these two have enduring reputations in the performance luxury SUV segment. The way I see it, the Q8 can't just easily compete with them. Additionally, what hurts the Q8 more is the very feature that makes it distinct. Specifically, the coupe-style design of the Q8 sacrifices a lot of real estate on its rear seat and cargo. Keep in mind that many buyers shifted from sedans to SUVs because of the amount of usable space that SUVs offer. The Q8, having a few of these things, is a bit of a betrayal of the reason that SUVs became popular in the first place, don't you think? The trend towards more spacious, family-friendly SUVs also dampens the appeal of luxury coupe SUVs like the Q8, which prioritize style over practicality. Combined with recent economic pressures that have made consumers more price-conscious, these factors contribute to the Q8's slower sales pace. Jeep Grand Wagoneer Another car that I got a big fat L for this month is the Grand Wagoneer. Well, this one is something that I saw coming from miles already. The Jeep Grand Wagoneer has a high market day supply of 288, which means that its sales aren't doing that well here in the United States. Similar to other cars on this list, the things that made the Wagoneer a poor performer in terms of getting actually sold are competition and price. Now, the Grand Wagoneer is the flagship luxury model of Jeep, but this thing is damn expensive. I am talking about a base price that starts near $90,000 and can exceed $110,000 with higher trims like the Series 3 Obsidian, which is downright ridiculous. And if you haven't got the picture yet, then yeah, the Grand Wagoneer is one of the most expensive Jeeps ever. I am not going to throw stones at Jeep because they stationed the Wagoneer in such a high place. But hey, it has tough competition from other more established luxury competitors like the Cadillac Escalade and Lincoln Navigator. And if we are going to take the European brands in the fray, such as the Mercedes-Benz GLS, it's kind of difficult for the Wagoneer to stand out. Those cars have comparable levels of refinement and prestige. In fact, some of them are just objectively better than the Grand Wagoneer. So, between them and this premium Jeep SUV, it's kind of clear which buyers should choose. Despite the Grand Wagoneer's impressive features, which include a powerful 6.4-liter V8 engine, a high-end Macintosh sound system, and advanced tech options, it still hasn't rooted itself as a solid choice in the solid market. Additionally, economic uncertainties and rising interest rates have made buyers more cautious about luxury cars, especially cars that are as pricey as the Grand Wagoneer. That means that even if it's capable and perfect, almost no American would want to buy it. Fiat 500e The Fiat 500e ranks the same as the Jeep Grand Wagoneer when it comes to market day supply. So basically, it's a slow seller, and there aren't many sales among the different dealerships throughout the United States. This one doesn't require a hard time of guessing. 
anyone can tell that Fiat isn't really a hot brand in the U.S. Even in the past, the Fiat wasn't a buyer magnet brand, which is why most of its production vehicles haven't seen the pedestal that they badly needed. The brand presence of Fiat is weak, and it's the very factor that drowns its cars, such as the 500e, into obscurity. Since the 500e, in particular, is navigating the rocky electric vehicle market, the competition it's facing isn't easy to overcome. Originally launched as an electric version of the Fiat 500, the 500e wanted to appeal to urban drivers with its compact size and European styling. Of course, there's a niche of buyers here in the U.S. for this type of car. However, as I've mentioned, Fiat struggled to keep the 500e afloat in the race because of its minimal brand recognition. More salt is added to its wound because the dealership network of Fiat here in the U.S. is quite scant. You can't make a vehicle popular if it can't be seen. That's the unspoken golden rule. Compounding this is the 500e's limited driving range. It's under 100 miles on a single charge for earlier models, which is bad, like really, really bad. It lagged behind more versatile EVs like the Chevrolet Bolt and Nissan Leaf, which cover distances like long-range precision rifles. Plus, for the sake of comparison, the Nissan Leaf and Chevy Bolt offer a more extensive dealer network and support. That screws a lesser-known brand like the Fiat. Additionally, its small size and two-door layout did not suit the preferences of many American buyers. We like it big, even to things such as our car doors. Despite its affordability, the 500E's limited utility and Fiat's narrower customer base here in the U.S. made it difficult for the model to gain significant sales. BMW 5 Series I did not expect to see the BMW 5 Series on the car edge's data, to be honest. My own impressions tell that this car is good. Of course, yes, I already had this one on a test drive, and it's really a good ride. Hence, I am kind of disappointed that it's currently second among the slowest-selling cars in the United States, with a marked day supply of 305. In the grand scheme, I can't really blame BMW here. It's just that, similar to other cars here, the BMW 5 Series is struck badly by rising competition in the luxury segment, shifting consumer preference, and, of course, its good old high entry price. The thing is, the BMW 5 Series is traditionally popular within the luxury sedan segment. This is a fact that nobody can dispute. However, such a rapport is also the reason why there's a dwindling interest in the said car in the U.S. market. Right now, it's kind of obvious that American consumers continue to gravitate toward SUVs and crossovers, which offer more versatility for families and active lifestyles. And for a similar price, SUVs tend to offer more value than a sedan like the 5 Series. A sedan, regardless of how fancy its features are, remains restricted when it comes to the practicality department. Additionally, competitors like the Mercedes-Benz E-Class and Audi A6 provide strong alternatives with similar performance, technology, and brand prestige, making the 5 Series less distinctive. I didn't see these luxury cars on the bottom rankings, and that tells a lot about the plight of the 5 Series. Maybe pricing has a role? I don't know, but the 5 Series kick started around $59,900, so it's a bit out of reach or less compelling compared to luxury SUVs in the same price bracket that offer more space and practicality. So even if this thing features BMW's hallmark driving dynamics and advanced technology options, such as the latest iDrive infotainment system, these attributes couldn't just offset the factors that wreck its sales. Nissan Z is the Nissan Z a flop? I don't know. However, according to CarEdge, it has an extremely high market day supply, which is about 350, and that means that not many of its units are being driven out from the dealerships. Of course, it's not that easy to pinpoint the exact reason why the Nissan Z isn't selling hot. Perhaps it's a combination of high competition, market shifts, and strategic missteps. Perhaps, but there's a basis for this speculation. By the way, the latest models of the Nissan Z boast a 400-horsepower, twin-turbo V6 engine and head-turning styling. Basically, it's meant to appeal to the competitive sports car segment. But as I said, it's a stacked niche, and if you are a buyer, it's easier to buy something that's more established and trusted. Take the Toyota GR Supra. Plus, I can't deny that the Supra implements a more refined driving verve. It's strong, robust, and sends adrenaline in your veins. 
and between Toyota and Nissan, I guess it's quite clear which car brand people would prefer. And yeah, let's not forget its price. It's $55,000 for its base model, which means that not all can afford it. Compounded by the fact that for its price, it lacks the technological and interior advancements that many other vehicles in its price range offer. And it's no secret that this thing has limited availability. The market supply chain constraints have affected its presence on dealership lots, so even if you argue that the Nissan Z is a good car, all odds are against it. And that completes this list. Thanks for sticking to the end. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and share buttons. I know it's a chore, but it helps the channel a lot. Until next time, drive safely.